Sehr geehrte Frau Premierministerin Kallas, sehr geehrter Professor Paquet, Exzellenzen, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren Abgeordneten, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Es freut mich sehr, Sie heute hier von Seiten der Allianz als Hausherr zur 16. Rede zur Freiheit der Friedrich-Naumann-Stiftung für die Freiheit im Allianzforum am Brandenburger Tor zu begrüßen. Mein Name ist Dirk Förderer, ich bin Leiter Politik, Regulierung und Zukunftsthemen Deutschland der Allianz SE. Es ist mittlerweile eine schöne Tradition, dass die Friedrich-Naumann-Stiftung für die Freiheit diese Rede regelmäßig hier veranstaltet. Seien Sie uns auch in diesem Jahr herzlich willkommen. Vor allem sind wir auch froh, dass es in so großer Präsenz möglich ist. Dabei bietet sich das Brandenburger Tor für diese Rede natürlich ganz besonders an, seit es mit dem Mauerfall für viele als Symbol der Freiheit gilt und gewissermaßen ein Tor zur Freiheit bildet. Und auch wenn vieles ist wie in den vergangenen Jahren, so ist in diesem Jahr auch vieles anders. Und das hat natürlich mit dem furchtbaren Krieg und den dramatischen Entwicklungen in der Ukraine zu tun, die Russland treibt. Neu ist dieser Konflikt leider nicht, aber die Qualität und Dramatik des Krieges sind es sicherlich. Angesichts dieser katastrophalen Entwicklung und des unendlichen Leids reicht es nicht mehr zu betonen, dass Freiheit kostbar, unverzichtbar und vor allem nicht selbstverständlich ist. 
und dass, wo keine Freiheit ist, bald auch der Frieden stirbt und dass Krieg immer furchtbares menschliches Leid und Ungerechtigkeit bedeutet. Das ist zwar richtig, reicht aber nicht mehr. Ich trage keine politische Verantwortung und deshalb möchte ich mich aus meiner Rolle mit konkreten Ratschlägen oder gar Forderungen an die Politik zurückhalten. Dennoch möchte ich ein paar Gedanken als Vorschläge mit Ihnen teilen, wie wir auf unseren gesellschaftlichen Diskurs sehen sollten. Denn wir alle sind Teil dieses Diskurses, dieses Diskurses zur Freiheit. Und es ist wichtig, dass hier die richtigen Akzente gesetzt werden. Denn wenn wir das nicht tun, wer dann? Was also sollten wir aus der aktuellen Entwicklung lernen? Ich will das entlang einiger kurzer Thesen tun. Erstens. Es gab und gibt kein Ende der Geschichte, auch wenn es zwischenzeitlich nach dem Mauerfall für die Sache der Freiheit wirklich sehr gut aussah. Das bedeutet zweitens, der Preis der Freiheit ist ewige Wachsamkeit. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Dieser Satz, der dem dritten US-Präsidenten Thomas Jefferson zugeschrieben wird, den habe ich auch in den letzten Jahren hier schon zitiert. Er bestätigt sich leider umso mehr. Drittens, Vorsicht mit scheinbaren Friedensdividenden durch Einsparung von Vorsorge. Gerade als Versicherer kann ich sagen, auch unwahrscheinliche Szenarien und Risiken muss man mitdenken und entsprechend vorsorgen. Bedauerlich ist, dass gerade unsere demonstrierte Friedfertigkeit und unsere Zurückhaltung im Bereich Rüstung manche Aggressoren in ihrer offensiven Haltung eher ermutigt zu haben scheinen. Und mittlerweile ist ja wohl auch Konsens, dass unsere Verteidigungsausgaben dauerhaft spürbar erhöht werden müssen. Dazu fällt mir das Zitat aus Schillers Wilhelm Tell ein. Es kann der Frömmste nicht in Frieden leben, wenn es dem bösen Nachbarn nicht gefällt. Viertens. Wir brauchen einen klaren Wertekompass, gerade in schwerer politischer See wie jetzt. Natürlich müssen wir immer alle Aspekte und Realitäten in unseren Überlegungen berücksichtigen. Bei manchen Fragen, zum Beispiel dem Klimawandel, sind globale Lösungen unverzichtbar. Und auch in manchen wirtschaftspolitischen und geostrategischen Fragen müssen wir globale Realitäten anerkennen und in unserer Positionierung berücksichtigen. Wichtig ist aber auch, dass unser Wertekompass uns unmissverständlich zeigt, dass wir Mitglied der Gruppe der offenen und freien Gesellschaften sind die nicht nur nach dem Recht des Stärkeren funktionieren. Das ist umso wichtiger, weil man den Eindruck gewinnen kann, dass wir offenen und freiheitlich verfassten Gesellschaften gerade mindestens temporär in die Defensive gedrängt werden. Deswegen ist es gut zu vermessen, wer bei welchem Thema Partner ist – in Europa, im Westen und im Rest der Welt. Vielfältige Partnerschaften sind gut. Aber Partnerschaften mit Ländern, die unsere Werte nicht teilen, können uns auch in problematische Abhängigkeiten und im Konfliktfall letztlich in schwere Bedrängnis bringen. Fünftens. Insgesamt gute Erfahrungen haben wir mit multilateralen Ansätzen gemacht, seien es Institutionen wie die NATO, die EU, das Eurosystem, die UNO, aber auch informelleren Ansätzen wie G7 und G20. Sie sind sicher nicht perfekt aber auch in Zukunft unsere größte Hoffnung. Denn Multilateralismus arbeitet am ehesten regelgebunden und schützt deshalb gerade auch die Kleinen und Schwachen institutionell. Natürlich müssen Vorteile und Lasten der multilateralen Einbindung akzeptabel verteilt und den Menschen auch erklärt werden. Dabei darf, ja man muss sogar, kritische Fragen stellen. Denn Ungleichgewichte führen zu Spannungen. Wir sehen das zum Beispiel bei der Diskussion zur Lastenverteilung in der NATO, der EU, aber auch im Eurosystem. Aber nachfragen und ausbalancieren heißt eben gerade nicht Ausstieg. Ich bin gespannt, von Premierministerin Kallas gerade hierzu heute die estnische Perspektive zu hören. Sechstens. Angesichts der verschärften Lage brauchen wir jetzt ein noch beherzteres Steuern in Richtung Freiheit in vielen Bereichen einen größeren politischen Umbau, zum Beispiel in den Bereichen Energie und Rohstoffe, Handel und Rüstung. Zur Wahrheit gehört, dass dieser Umbau nicht ganz ohne Brüche gehen wird. Dabei werden leider auch die Spielräume für andere, ebenfalls drängende Themen, geringer werden. Wir brauchen deswegen klare Prioritäten und intelligente Pläne, 
Aber wir müssen das, was jetzt auf uns zukommt, auch gut erklären. Das ist ganz entscheidend. Weder sollten wir versuchen, unbequeme Wahrheiten zu übertünchen oder gar zu verschweigen, noch reicht es, einfach auf Ingeborg Bachmann zu verweisen und zu sagen, die Wahrheit ist dem Menschen zumutbar. Unsere jüngste Erfahrungen mit Populismus und politischer Polarisierung, auch im Westen, haben uns gelehrt, dass wir gerade schwierige Themen verständlich und integrierend erklären müssen und die Menschen kommunikativ mitnehmen. Das ist die anspruchsvolle, erwachsene Lösung der offenen Gesellschaft. Es gibt nicht immer einfache, preisgünstige Lösungen und Wahrheiten. Wir müssen selbst denken, zuhören, diskutieren, oft auch streiten und verhandeln. Wir werden oft mehr kritisiert als gelobt. Aber insgesamt kommen wir so zu neuen Einsichten und letztlich tragfähigeren, robusteren, nachhaltigeren Lösungen. Wir dürfen vor dieser Rüttelphase keine Angst haben. Auch wenn es beim Umsteuern im gesellschaftlichen Diskurs manchmal knarzt und knirscht, das tut es und das wird es auch weiter tun, so ist mir nicht bange. Denn das ist, wenn wir es richtig machen, der Sound der Freiheit, die Musik der offenen Gesellschaft und der Vorbote einer doch noch besseren und freieren Zukunft für uns alle. In diesem Sinne bin ich gespannt, zuerst auf Ihre Ausführungen, Herr Professor Paquet, und dann auf die Ausführungen von Frau Premierministerin Kallas. Herzlichen Dank. Sehr geehrte Premierministerin Kala Kallas, liebe Kaya Kallas, sehr geehrter Herr Dr. Förderer, sehr geehrte Mitglieder der nationalen Parlamente, verehrte Gäste, liebe Freunde, ich freue mich sehr, Sie im Namen der Friedrich-Naumann-Stiftung zur diesjährigen Rede zur Freiheit begrüßen zu dürfen. Herr Förderer hat das bereits angedeutet, endlich wieder in Präsenz. Die Rede zur Freiheit stellt jedes Jahr einen Höhepunkt in der Arbeit unserer Stiftung dar. Heute, vor dem Hintergrund des russischen Angriffskriegs auf die Ukraine, ist die Rede zur Freiheit notwendiger und wichtiger denn je. Denn unsere Freiheit, meine Damen und Herren, wird derzeit keine 1000 Kilometer von unserer eigenen Landesgrenze entfernt verteidigt. Es sind die mutigen Ukrainerinnen und Ukrainer, die für unsere freiheitlich-demokratischen Werte kämpfen auf den Straßen und auf den Schlachtfeldern. Jeder ist daran beteiligt. Die politische Führung, angefangen von Präsident Zelensky über Parlamentsabgeordnete bis hin zu lokalen Bürgermeistern, die darauf bestehen, trotz der unerbittlichen Bombardierung vor Ort zu bleiben. Furchtlose Bürgerinnen und Bürger, die versuchen, sich russischen Panzern in den Weg zu stellen, Soldatinnen und Soldaten, die für die Freiheit und für das Recht auf Selbstbestimmung bereit sind, ihr Leben zu geben. Wir Deutsche dürfen die Ukrainerinnen und Ukrainer in diesem wichtigen Kampf nicht alleine lassen. Denn es ist auch unser Kampf. Putin will ein anderes Europa. Und das ist ganz bestimmt kein Europa, das uns gefallen kann. Die Ukrainer kämpfen daher auch für unsere Freiheit und es ist unsere Pflicht, sie dabei zu unterstützen. Applaus Gleichzeitig, meine Damen und Herren, müssen wir auch in unsere eigene Resilienz investieren und das gleich in zweierlei Hinsicht. Erstens 
ganz offensichtlich, es wurde vorher schon gesagt, in unsere eigene Verteidigungsfähigkeit, um den Bedrohungen von heute und von morgen entschieden begegnen zu können. Und zweitens durch die Stärkung unserer eigenen Demokratien und unserer eigenen Institutionen, die immer wieder von den Feinden der Freiheit inner- und außerhalb unserer Grenzen angegriffen werden. Die deutsche Bundesregierung, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, hat dafür erste Weichen gestellt. In seiner historischen Rede vor dem Bundestag Ende Februar hat Bundeskanzler Olaf Scholz unsere Unterstützung für die Ukraine zugesagt und Investitionen in die eigene Sicherheit und Verteidigung angekündigt. Die sogenannte Zeitenwende mache diese Schritte notwendig. So dankbar ich dem Bundeskanzler für seine klaren Worte vom 27. Februar bin, so möchte ich dennoch betonen, dass der Begriff Zeitenwende die politische Situation der letzten zwei Jahrzehnte verkennt und möglicherweise zu fehlgeleiteten Schlussfolgerungen angesichts künftiger Herausforderungen und Antagonisten führt. Zeitenwende hat etwas Plötzliches, ein überraschendes Moment. Aber sind wir wirklich von einem auf den anderen Tag in einer völlig anderen Welt aufgewacht? Kam dieser Krieg tatsächlich so überraschend oder haben wir die Anzeichen nur nicht gesehen oder gar nicht sehen wollen? Mit dem Georgienkrieg 2008 und mit der Annektierung der Krim im Jahr 2014 hat Putin bereits seine ganze Skrupellosigkeit offenbart. Die Reaktion des Westens fiel, fiel damals eher mäßig aus. Zwar verurteilte man die Einverleibung ukrainischen Territoriums scharf, doch handfeste Konsequenzen gab es kaum. Hielt man Putins Angriff auf die Krim für eine einmalige Ausnahme, die keiner so harten Bestrafung bedarf, konnte uns der Kreml wirklich so heimtückisch hinters Licht führen, dass wir sein wahres Gesicht nicht sehen konnten? Meine Damen und Herren, wer das skrupellose Vorgehen der russischen Führung gegen demokratische Kräfte im Inland und im Ausland in den vergangenen Jahren genau studiert hat, muss zu dem Schluss kommen, der Angriffskrieg auf die Ukraine kam nicht überraschend. Er kam fast mit Ankündigung. Die Missachtung des Völkerrechts ist eine der wesentlichen Konstanten russischer Politik gewesen. Russlands Großmachtstreben wurde geflissentlich übersehen oder schlimmer noch, implizit akzeptiert. Mahnende Stimmen, insbesondere die unserer Nachbarn im östlichen Mitteleuropa und in den baltischen Staaten, diese mahnenden Stimmen wurden ignoriert. Ich sage das ganz klar an dieser Stelle, vor allem in diesem Land, in Deutschland. Die berechtigte Kritik an Nord Stream 2 wurde mit dem Verweis auf die wirtschaftliche Notwendigkeit in den Wind geschlagen, während die geopolitische Brisanz des Projektes fahrlässig ausgeklammert wurde. Dieser Fehler, meine Damen und Herren, holt uns jetzt wieder ein und wird uns teuer zu stehen kommen. Meine Damen und Herren, wir haben in den vergangenen Tagen und Wochen viele Schuldbekundungen und Selbstbezichtigungen von Politikern vernommen, die diese fehlgeleitete Russlandpolitik mitgetragen haben. Diese Einsicht ist richtig und diese Einsicht ist wichtig. Noch wichtiger ist es aber, vergangene Fehler durch entschiedenes Handeln heute und in der Zukunft 
wegzumachen. Diese, wenn auch späte Einsicht, sollte ein Anlass geben, heute unverbrüchlich an der Seite der Ukraine zu stehen. Und sie sollte uns eine Lehre sein, auf die mahnenden Stimmen unserer Partner im östlichen Mitteleuropa zu hören und ihre Sicherheitsinteressen und berechtigten Sorgen endlich wahrzunehmen und endlich ernst zu nehmen, meine Damen und Herren. Eine dieser mahnenden Stimmen ist heute unter uns. Es ist mir eine außerordentliche Ehre, Ihre Exzellenz, Premierministerin Kaya Kallas, als unsere Freiheitsrednerin vorzustellen. Dear Kaya, we are proud and honored in the liberal community of Europe and the world, I may say, to welcome you today here at the Brandenburg Gate. Kaya Kallas ist die Premierministerin Estlands, einer kleinen Nation mit einer tragischen Geschichte im Zusammenleben mit Russland. Nicht nur aufgrund der Erfahrungen ihres Landes weiß Frau Kallas den russischen Nachbarn einzuschätzen. Auch ihre eigene Familiengeschichte ist von einschneidenden Ereignissen geprägt, die zeigen, was es heißt, unter totalitärer Herrschaft zu leben. Ihre Großmutter und ihre Mutter, ihre Mutter war damals ein gerade einmal sechs Monate alter Säugling, ihre Großmutter und ihre Mutter wurden von Stalin nach Sibirien deportiert und für ein Jahrzehnt ins Exil verbannt. Ihr Großvater wurde in ein sibirisches Lager geschickt. Ihre Familiengeschichte prägt die Premierministerin bis heute und leitet ihr politisches Handeln. Als Premierministerin und erste Frau in diesem Amt hat sie sich bereits heute einen Namen in den europäischen Geschichtsbüchern gesichert. Das überrascht nicht, denn die Geschichte des modernen Estlands mit all ihren tragischen aber auch mit ihren glücklichen Wendungen. Diese Geschichte spiegelt sich in der Familiengeschichte Kallas wider. Ihr Urgroßvater war einer der Gründer des modernen Estlands im Jahr 1918, am Ende des Ersten Weltkriegs, als die Landkarte Europas neu gezeichnet wurde. Ihr Vater, Sim Kallas, Ebenfalls, das sage ich mit einem gewissen Stolz, mit der Friedrich-Naumann-Stiftung für die Freiheit eng verbunden, war von 2002 bis 2003 estnischer Premierminister und erster Vorsitzender der 1994 gegründeten liberalen Reformpartei in Estland. Dass Estland weltweiter Vorreiter in Sachen Digitalisierung und Vorzeigeland unter den Transformationsländern ist, verdankt es letztlich auch der Reformpartei, die so, etwas, die so etwas wie eine stabile politische Konstante des Landes geworden ist. Als Mitglied der europäischen und internationalen liberalen Parteifamilie setzt sich die Partei für eine offene Gesellschaft, eine klare Westorientierung und für den technischen Fortschritt ein. Und wenn man nach Estland reist, das sieht man, wir sind in vielerlei Hinsicht Bewunderer des Landes geworden. E-Estonia, um nur einen Begriff zu nennen, E-Estonia ist kein leerer Begriff. Wie Ihr Vater und Urgroßvater vor ihr, vor ihr gestaltet heute Kaya Kallas als Vorsitzende der liberalen Reformpartei und Premierministerin die Zukunft Estlands mit. Mehr noch, ihr Handeln wirkt nach ganz Europa hinein. In den vergangenen Wochen und Monaten ist Premierministerin Kallas zu einer führenden Stimme Europas gegen den Krieg in der Ukraine geworden. 
Sie hat maßgeblich dazu beigetragen, härtere Maßnahmen gegen Russland zu ergreifen und eine europäische Antwort auf Putins barbarischen Angriffskrieg anzumahnen und zu fordern. Es war auch Premierministerin Kallas, die Bundeskanzler Olaf Scholz aufforderte, mit unserer historischen Praxis zu brechen und Estland zu gestatten, in seinem Besitz befindliche Waffen aus deutscher Produktion an die Ukraine zu liefern. Auch wird sie nicht müde, vor Putins Großmachtbestrebungen zu warnen und immer wieder zu betonen, dass Putin keine Atempause oder gar eine zweite Chance eingeräumt werden darf. Sie fordert von uns allen, unseren Teil dazu beizutragen, um unsere Freiheit, unsere Demokratie und unseren Wohlstand in Europa zu schützen. Gleichzeitig zeichnet sich Premierministerin Kallas als ehemalige Europaabgeordnete – und ich sehe einige Vertreter – Europas hier im Raum, die es früher waren oder noch sind, als ehemalige Europaabgeordnete durch ihren festen Glauben an die Fähigkeiten der westlichen Wertegemeinschaft und ihren unerschütterlichen europäischen Kompass in die Politik hineinzuwirken. Ihre Zuversicht in die Stärke der freiheitlichen Welt gegenüber illiberalen und autoritären Regimen ist ansteckend und lässt auch in den dunkelsten Stunden hoffen. Denn wir Liberale sind ja nun mal Optimisten. Wir können gar nicht anders. Damit dient sie uns deutschen Liberalen als Beispiel, als Vorbild. Wir müssen mit Vertrauen in die Strahlkraft unserer Werte in die Zukunft schauen. Nur so kann sich das freiheitlich-liberale Gesellschaftsmodell gegen die autoritären und totalitären Regime dieser Welt durchsetzen. Wir haben das geistige und im Prinzip auch das moralische Rüstzeug dazu, um den Herausforderungen von heute und morgen zu begegnen. Und wir haben gleichzeitig die Verpflichtung, dies zu nutzen. Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, ich möchte Sie jetzt herzlich einladen, mit mir Ihre Exzellenz Premierministerin Kaya Kallas zu begrüßen. Frau Kallas, wir freuen uns auf Ihre Rede zur Freiheit, wobei wir, glaube ich, vorher noch ein Musikstück haben. Ist wohl so. Ich habe jetzt nicht mehr noch mal ins Programm geguckt. Und an dieser Stelle darf ich vielleicht einflechten, Musica Libra, dass die musizieren heute für uns Stipendiatinnen und Stipendiaten der Stiftung. Auch auf die sind wir stolz, meine Damen und Herren. Ich wünsche einen interessanten Abend.
Vielen Dank an die Musiker Libera, Shelley Ezra und Olivia Meiser. Herzlichen Dank an Sie. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Ich bin Melinda Crane und ich habe die große Ehre, nachher den Dialog mit der Premierministerin zu führen. Ein ganz kurzes Wort zur Sprache, bevor ich die Bühne übergebe. Die Premierministerin wird Englisch sprechen. Für alle, die sich eine simultane Übersetzung wünschen, haben wir Headsets im Raum. Und für die Gäste, die uns im Livestream verfolgen, Sie können auf den Tab Sprache klicken und dann haben auch Sie eine Übersetzung. Und nun begrüßen Sie bitte mit mir unsere Keynote-Rednerin, die Premierministerin von der Republik Estland, Kaya Kallas. Dear Kaya Kallas, the floor is yours. Dear guests, dear friends, uh, this is really, really a great honor to be here today and thank you for all the kind words. I was in Berlin for the first time in 1988 uh, as an 11-year-old. Perestroika had just begun and for me it was a miracle that we could go to Eastern Germany, a foreign country. My father took me along uh, with my brother as close as to the Brandenburg Gate as possible. I vividly recall him saying, kids, breathe deeply in. It's the air of freedom that comes from the other side. At the time, I didn't really understand what he meant. It is, it is said that you only appreciate freedom when it's taken from you. But as a child born under Soviet occupation, I never had experienced freedom. Soon enough, the wind of change began to blow, tearing down the wall in Berlin as well as elsewhere in Europe. And I was able to breathe in this air of freedom also at home. 30 years ago, when Estonia managed to get out of the totalitarian prison in 1991, I was a teenager. What was a turn, the Wende, for you, was a revolution for us. After regaining independence and freedom, Estonia had a difficult task, to build a free and open society, a parliamentary democracy. This was not an easy task, despite the relief that people were finally free. Re-establishing a democratic relationship between the citizen and the state is not something you do overnight, and it's nothing you can learn from books. Our way to freedom was accompanied and supported by many friends from the free world. Here, Germany had a special leadership and support. Allow me to make some links in this regard. After the collapse of Soviet Union, we first had rapidly established a new so social contract and anchor this agreement to our constitution. While drafting our constitution in 1992, Roman Herzog, president of the Federal Constitutional Court at the time, was an expert drafting the chapter on fundamental freedoms, rights, and duties. In fact, the proportion of this chapter speaks for itself, as it amounts to more than one quarter of the whole text. The German legal system formed the foundation while re-establishing central parts of a private, criminal, and administrative law. This also means that the whole generation of Estonian lawyers, myself included, studied German legal practice. 
Moreover, it was German Rett's theory that forms the basis of introductory class of the first year's law students in Estonia. Another milestone on the road to freedom was monetary reform carried out by my father, Seem Gallas. Free Estonia had to have its own money. In 1992, the Estonian Kron was reintroduced. With the blessing of the Bundesbank, we tied the Estonian Kron to the German mark, the most suitable anchor currency which provided an additional guarantee to our currency stability. This monetary reform is considered by the IMF to be one of the most successful in history. Ladies and gentlemen, Russian aggression against Ukraine has forced us to think about what freedom means for each and every one of us, and how fragile it can be, and what it takes to safeguard it. At this dark hour in Europe, the importance of keeping our own democratic house in order is more acute than ever. We need to take care of this democratic relationship between the state and the citizen. As much as it is the individual responsibility of every citizen to care for democracy, it is the leaders who are responsible for keeping the rights of individuals and the rule of law at the center of governance. Leaders must also safeguard strong institutions to support it. And this is not self-evident. Attacks on democratic institutions are on the rise from within our own democracies as well as from outside. A rest with strong institutions is important, however, not sufficient for safeguarding the freedom from an outright aggressor. I speak to you here in Berlin when the regime in Kremlin is destroying its neighbor, Ukraine, and tries to conquer the second largest country by area in Europe. It is only 1,400 kilometers from here that Russia is shelling a European capital. When I was breeding in the era of freedom back in 1988, both Estonians and Ukrainians were on the wrong, evil side of the wall. Today, Kremlin tries to build another wall to divide Europe, and this time, Estonia is lucky to be on the right, the free side of this. The same cannot unfortunately be said for Ukraine. Times like these make us look back to the brave decisions in our past. I praise the decision-making courage of our leaders and those of the free world who made it possible for so many Central and Eastern European countries to reintegrate rapidly to Europe. Speaker of our erstwhile parliament, the Supreme Council of Estonia, Ulo Nuki, said already in 1991, as political and historical experience has shown, neutrality did not guarantee our security. This may not guarantee our security even today, especially in view of the possible processes in Soviet Union. He said it in reference to the 1930s when the young Estonian Republic tried to balance between two evil empires. This ended with losing our statehood for 50 years. Hence, it was only natural that in the 1990s, our foreign and security policy focus was set to joining NATO and to joining EU. We decided that we are never alone again. The free world, including Germany, played a key role in restoring our country and place on the world map. And it is no secret that to many, the weight and boldness of those decisions at the time have only become apparent now, while witnessing Russian aggression against Ukraine. Current dangerous and tragic times also reveal how democracy matters, 
and how liberties and freedoms matter. Why is Russia fighting the war in Ukraine? It started when Ukraine chose its democratic path. Russia does not want to freedom and dem democracy to prevail. It is direct threat to dictatorship because in democracy, governments are held accountable at elections and states should deliver for the people, not for the dictator and its cronies. When we look at Russia, we see darkness. Fear is keeping its society together. And we see thousands fleeing the country. We know this fear. Fear of secret police who seized people in the middle of the night, arrested for placards in the square. Fear for the constant mistrust. Fear to express your opinion. Fear for the atrocities that might follow. Tens of thousands of Estonians fled the same tyranny after the World War II. While Ukrainians are defending the freedom they have built, the Russian killing machine wishes, and I cite, to change the bloody and false consciousness of a part of today's Ukrainians. These are the words of Dmitry Medvedev. The Kremlin and Putin have made it clear by their statements that their aim is to wipe Ukraine off the map. Denazification is the official Russian label of this policy of destruction of the Ukrainian state and its people. The word Nazi is used to justify its aggression and genocidal and fascist policies. How is this possible? I say that history matters. Although the Soviet Union collapsed, its imperialistic ideology never did. While our history books have been rewritten after the collapse of the Soviet Union, this was not the case for Russia. While the crimes of Nazism have been unequivocally condemned in the whole world, this has not been done for the crimes of communism. Instead, Putin has built a strong revival of Stalinism, and as a result, the opinion polls suggest that 70% of Russians approve of Stalin and his policies, 70%. If people admire dictators, there is no moral obstacle to becoming one or to submitting to one. The warning signs were there. Imperial nostalgia. In fact, Russia kept the Soviet anthem. The narrative of Russian victimhood combined with the heavy anti-Western propaganda while closing down free media. And we witnessed Putin's wars in Chechnya, Georgia, Donbas, and Crimea. Looking back at the past signs, a return to war and aggression seems inevitable. There is a clear pattern in Russia's road to totalitarianism. This road to tyranny is symbolically captured by the man who was recently arrested in Moscow for standing on the street and holding the book, War and Peace. The past Putin's wars illustrate why he must not win this war, and why Moscow cannot be allowed to pretend that it has gained anything in the process. We have let Putin get away with aggression several times before. We cannot let him get away with it again now. Were, were that to happen, his appetite would only grow and more atrocities and more human suffering will follow. Putin's strategic aims have not changed. 
The suffering and devastation in Ukraine is far from over. Prime Minister Denis Migal says, if Russia stops fighting, there will be peace. If Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no more Ukraine. We have reached the moment where we should have courage to say, Ukraine must win this war. And we must act accordingly. Freedom must be armed better than tyranny. Dear listeners, we are in this for the long haul, and we need to hardwire these profound changes into a long-term policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I have labeled it as a policy of smart containment. That means that we need to continue to support Ukraine's fight for freedom, while building up pressure against aggressor with further sanctions and political and economical isolation. This also means that we need to make a huge leap forward when it comes to our own defense. NATO's defense in the Baltic Sea region needs a substantial change. We need significantly more combat-ready troops stationed in the Baltic states, more fighter jets in our sky, and ships in the Baltic Sea. We also need to have a very clear understanding. Putin and all of those who have committed war crimes have to know that their judgment day will come. It is clear that after all these atrocities, there should be no way back to business as usual with Putin's Russia. In fact, there should be no business at all. Russia should have no seat at the table of international organizations and bodies that are based on the respect of international law. It's high time for everyone to use their moral compass. Kremlin needs to feel that it's isolated. And free world should follow the motto, when the facts change, I change my mind. We have seen huge and historic turnarounds, also here in Germany. However, as long as the aggression is not stopped, we have not done enough. One of our main focus should be drying up Gremlin's war machine. Revenues from hydrocarbons lie at the heart of it. I understand the difficult choices leaders in democracies face today. I understand that rising inflation, in particular surge in the cost of energy, could mean that economic difficulties at home overshadow the sufferings of Ukrainians. Gas might be expensive, but freedom is priceless. It is up to every government to decide how much of the burden its people are ready to carry. But it's equally necessary we get the message through to our people. What is our neighbor's problem today is our problem tomorrow. We are in danger when our neighbor's house is on fire. Let me conclude with the warning words by Russian dissident and chess world champion Garry Kasparov, whom, with whom I had the pleasure of playing chess with. I lost, by the way. <laughs> and I quote, the price of stopping a dictator always goes up with every delay and every hesitation. Meeting evil halfway is still a victory for the evil, end of quote. Hitting the right balance with policies, understandable, understandably one of the biggest challenges for democracies and for our freedom today. However, were this war to be lost, it will not be lost by Ukraine, but by us. We
We know that the goodness always triumphs evil. This is also my life experience. While standing here now and breathing deeply in, that's the same freedom I was breathing in as an 11-year-old. And if we do everything to help Ukraine, there will be no 11-year-olds for whom the air of freedom is something they only experience from a distance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Prime Minister, for your stirring words. You shared with us that wonderful family photo and your recollections of that trip uh, to Berlin. You shared with the entire world other family recollections not too long ago, recollections that were triggered by the images that came out of Butcha, of deportations, of destruction, of civilian massacres. They were mentioned, of course, by Dr. Paquet also in his own remarks, uh, recollections that your own mother was deported as a small infant. Can you tell us how that shapes your thinking about the best response to Putin's war? Yes, it is true that the images that we see from Bucha uh, or from Ukraine actually also tear open the wounds that we have. I mean, these people are still alive that suffered the atrocities during communist time, and actually the playbook is absolutely the same. So therefore, I mean, uh, I'm of the lucky generation that had nothing, had, free, had, had no freedom, but then we got it back, whereas my grandparents are exactly the opposite. Uh, so everything was taken from them, and, and uh, their generation is, is uh, the one that suffered the most. And therefore, I think everybody who has that recollection, and I think every Estonian family has a story like this, uh, also feels that we have to do everything that the other people, the people in Ukraine, uh, will not suffer uh, the same fate. And, and we know why it was done. It was done to, you know, suppress uh, the will of the people, to, you know, kill absolutely every uh, uh, bit of hope uh, that the country had or, or, um, or to, you know, do anything with it. So, so I think we have to keep this in mind that um, help others not to um, suffer from it. Yes. Also following those images uh, from Butcha, you tweeted the following, this is not a battlefield, it's a crime scene. Mass killings of Ukrainian civilians by Russia are a clear war crime. And you repeated that in your statement and said that you are sure that Putin will be brought to justice. You're a lawyer, I am as well. We both know that war crimes trials can take decades uh, until the perpetrator is actually brought to the dock. What do you say to people who say, how could that make a difference? That makes a difference because um, there are concrete people actually committing the war crimes on uh, Ukraine's territory. And we have technology, the face recognition technology. If the, you know, the um, uh, message gets through that you will be tried, each one of you, and these crimes will not uh, in any way, uh, you know, they will be prosecuted um, over time. So, uh, so maybe it will keep some of the people from uh, doing those atrocities, committing those crimes on the scene. But the other, uh, other um, message which is very important is that Putin does not get away with this. I mean, as I said, uh, we have let Putin get away with the crimes already several times. And I didn't mention Syria, by the way. Uh, I only said Chechnya, uh, Georgia, uh, Donbas, Crimea. But there's also Syria, and and um, we see from uh, you know some 
Um, some countries who have said that, you know, let's go back to, let's talk to Putin, let's try to, you know, bring him to the table. Uh, we have done this mistake already three times, uh, four times. Uh, what happens is that he gets this message, you know, whatever I do, I can go further because nothing happens, nothing happens to me. And we have to get it very clear that you are not getting away with this. So. <laughs> Given your skepticism about the prospects for a negotiated peace settlement, you have recommended what you talked about in your speech, uh, smart containment for isolating Russia in order to limit its potential for aggression. Now, containment worked with the latter-day Soviet Union in part because it was a status quo power. It was interested in preserving the existing balance of power. You yourself have said the current Russia is not that, that Putin is revanchist. He is looking essentially to realize what I think you refer to as an imperialist dream of restoring uh, past dominance. Do you think under those rather different circumstances, containment really can work? We have to isolate Russia uh, completely, economically, but also politically, uh, in the international fora, uh, everywhere we can. Uh, and, and also uh, putting in place uh, sanctions uh, that are really, really strong. And why? Because, uh, you know, um, the message gets through uh, when everybody is, is still I mean, calling him and 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 talking to him, uh, then uh, I don't think the message is going to go entirely uh, through that uh, this is not acceptable and there is no way back to the table, um, because when uh, when Russia or Putin feels that oh they're all talking to me is is now by no time they are inviting me back to the table and by the way before uh, the uh, war started, uh, remember the. Um, Security Council, weird Security Council meeting that uh, Putin was having with his, uh, you know, people. And, and there, uh, Dmitry Medvedev actually said, uh, so what will happen, uh, like the question was, and he said that, you know, there will be sanctions, uh, those are going to be hard, but we are going to survive, and by no time they will grow tired of their own initiative and ask us back to the table. We should not give them that. This is what they expect. And we should give them clear signal that this is, this is no go. You have gone too far, and, and this is not acceptable. I want to come back to that point in a minute. Um, but just playing devil's advocate for a moment in terms of isolating uh, Putin. One argument that one sometimes hears is that if backed into a corner, he could conclude he has nothing to lose by further escalation. What do you say to that? I mean, uh, further escalation, uh, it is al already uh, quite, uh, quite awful, uh, the pictures that we see, uh, all the deeds that he's committing, he's targeting civilians, uh, and not that they are the war casualty, but that he's targeting civilians because he wants to, uh, to do as much harm as possible. So, um, um, you know, further escalation. Um, this is the fear that uh, Russia is playing because uh, what they are really, really good at is, you know, picking the fears that different countries have. Oh, you have a nuclear fear? I play to your nuclear fear. I'm going to use the nuclear weapons. You have a fear that uh, I'm going to go across the borders. I, I give you this fear. So, so we shouldn't be uh, afraid. It takes uh, courage to you know, uh, look up, of course, to be brave. Uh, it doesn't mean that you are not afraid, but you stand up to this and, and really uh, see, is it really possible if we weigh, can it go any, any worse than that? Because if we cross is the line, I mean, uh, the line to uh, NATO's countries, then, then he's going to have uh, the war with NATO's countries. And I don't think he's willing to do that, really. Let's take a uh, deeper dive on the topic of sanctions. And you have called for the EU, again, I'm, I'm quoting, to put up the toughest sanctions that we can. 
to have the pain right now to end the war right now. Do you think that even a full embargo on Russian fossil fuels, all three, coal, uh, gas, and oil, could actually prompt a rethink, at least on a short-term basis, on the part of Putin? 40% of Russian budget is comprised of the uh, revenue from the hydrocarbons, uh, coal, oil, and gas. 40%. Uh, so if uh, you take away the revenues from that, it definitely uh, you know, hurts the budget so that you can't finance uh, the war machine anymore. Of course, there is no easy solution. If we do this, you know, the war ends. But the, the sanctions really hurt. Why uh, Putin is trying to talk everybody out of lifting uh, the sanctions, uh, he wouldn't otherwise. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, I have also proposed a solution out of this because I know that uh, several countries have um, a much higher dependency on, on Russian gas and oil and can't really don't have really alternatives so I have proposed uh, you know alternative fine um, let there not be an embargo, but we can create a separate escrow account, say that we still pay uh, for your oil and gas, but we pay to a separate account. And this money can only be used for rebuilding Ukraine, because you owe uh, the rebuilding of Ukraine because you're destroying. And for me, it would kill uh, you know, three flies at the same time. One is that uh, it would uh, take away the war machine's finance, um, uh, so that he can't finance the war. Uh, second, it would be clear uh, signal, uh, clear message that every building you destroy, every infrastructure you damage, you are going to pay for this. And the third is that we already have money set aside in order to rebuild Ukraine. And, and I don't agree with those who say that, you know, let's forget about this. If there is peace, it is up to us in Europe to rebuild Ukraine. Why? We haven't destroyed Ukraine. Why should we pay? I mean, you, uh, Russia should pay. And, and being a lawyer, those of you who are lawyers know that, uh, that in every case, you are in much stronger position when you already have something that others have to claim from you than when you have nothing. So if we only have a claim that you have to uh, pay for the rebuilding of Ukraine, we are in a weaker position than we already withhold something that is uh, ours and we have to pay to Russia. So I think that could be a way around uh, those who don't want to put the oil embargo. And of course, there could be discussion whether it's 5%, 10% that we put aside but at least it is something so, so that it's still uh, less uh, for the war machine and it's still something to rebuild Ukraine. A smart sanctions proposal that also gets around. <laughs> that also gets around the paradox of the fact that Russia is profiting from the price increases that it actually has brought about through its own behavior. Sanctions like war crimes indictments take a very long time often to really show effects, and especially in the case of a totalitarian state like Russia, where in fact sanctions hurt the people more than they do the elites. Do you think that Europe truly, and this gets back to the point that you mentioned that Putin had made, or was it Medvedev at, the, uh, at that meeting on that Monday night, does Europe have the stamina to keep up with tough sanctions over a long period of time when we actually see the painful effects on the Russian people? That is a very good question. I'm more worried about, um, you know, um, uh, our values. Uh, why I say this is that um, if, um, if the prices go up, the first thing that goes out of the window is the values. You know, um, okay, uh, I don't really uh, care so much about the suffering that goes on somewhere else because I'm paying higher prices. And, and this is something uh, that I'm much more worried about. Uh, when we saw in 2014, I was a member of the European Parliament together with uh, some of good colleagues I see in the audience, and, and what we saw then, I mean, first the sanctions were introduced, and then when you were in plenary, you have 
all the representatives of different European countries. So they represent their people and their public opinion. And you had the discussion, um, you know, soon enough, you had the discussions that we should lift the sanctions because they don't really work. Uh, and, and uh, you know, let's forget about Crimea. Uh, let's, uh, let's see that uh, Putin doesn't move on. But if we forget about the atrocities committed, then there will be a pause of one year, two years, and then everything will continue even at worse uh, scale. So we shouldn't forget uh, that. Um, it would be, uh, or it will be painful, but it, uh, if we do it really, really hard sanctions, it will be painful for short term, and we could end the, uh, end the war. Whereas, you know, if we do it piece by piece, uh, then, uh, then it will also take longer. But saying this, I also uh, want to stress that we need strategic patience uh, regarding the sanctions. So not that, you know, there are two months or three months past and, you know, oh, they don't work anyway, let's f uh, lift the sanctions. I, I don't think we should do that. Thank you very much. Let's uh, move on with, I've got an bit of an eye on the clock, uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, weapons and deterrence, uh, including the role of NATO. And you have, as you also said in your speech, called for NATO to further sharpen its land, air, and sea defense capabilities in the Baltic Republic, saying that the Baltics essentially are the exposed peninsula of NATO, the most exposed, and therefore we need to move from a deterrence to a defensive posture. Do you see a real risk that Putin would set his sights on the Baltic Republic, uh, partly perhaps uh, claiming that he needs to go in to protect your own Russian-speaking minorities? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> Why? Um, because we are here, are we on the western side or eastern side right now? Eastern, eastern, eastern side. side, okay. Uh, yeah, 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 true, true, but uh, yes, uh, this is true, eastern side, I was on this side. Uh, this is how you forget that <laughs> 30 years and I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm a European, you know, <laughs> it's like forgetting all these things. Uh, but, uh, I mean, why I bring this Western Berlin up is that um, during the Cold War, Western Berlin would have been very easily militarily conquered. But it wasn't because it was under NATO's umbrella. Attack on one is attack on all. And that's why we don't see the attack is going to uh, happen on us because it means it, it, you're going to attack uh, United States, UK, Germany, France, and, and I don't see that. But at the same time, uh, I also say that if the level of aggression has, has grown uh, on the Russian side, the defense should also reflect the new situation. And that's why I argue that we have to strengthen the eastern flank and go from the deterrence posture to defense posture. Um, this means uh, more uh, NATO troops present in in the Baltic countries. Uh, it also means um, the common capabilities like air defense. Uh, and, and why, uh, if, if it is all there, then it acts uh, as a deterrent as it acted in the Western Berlin case, that Russia would not even dare to think about this. And what about Ukraine itself? What more would you want to see for Ukraine from Europe and also from a country like Germany? As, as long as the war continues, so we have not done enough. And of course, uh, as Estonia, I mean, <laughs> I get those calls from Ukrainians. We need this and this, and uh, let me see in my closet. <laughs> uh, but uh, we don't have much uh, anymore because we have already given uh, everything uh, we can. And that's why I say to the big countries, uh, bigger countries, that it I, I, it's very hard for me to believe, given, given everything that we have given, that you don't have anything. Uh, because, I mean, uh, when we had the NATO summit, uh, then uh, in my speech, I actually listed in absolute numbers, you know, all the, the uh, uh, 
military aid, uh, you know, anti-tank mines, uh, absolute numbers, what we have given. And, and to say that we are a country of 1.3 million people, we are 65 times smaller than Germany, and we have given six times more military aid than Germany. So there is a question mark whether, you know, maybe you still have something. Of course, we don't know, and it's up to every country to decide. Uh, while saying this, I think Germany has done a lot uh, by, by complete turnaround, the decision uh, made to give military aid, and that's also something. Uh, also, um, um, you know, Germany is a big democracy, which means that I totally understand that these kind of debates uh, take time. But the problem is that Ukraine does not have this time. Uh, therefore, we should move uh, much faster and see, uh, is there anything else uh, we can do? And I know that Estonia itself has now said that it will commit 2.5% of GDP to defense spending, which you have called a historic decision. As you know, Chancellor Scholz said in that historic landmark speech on the 27th of February that Germany will also in future uh, spend over 2%. Do you see this Seitenwende as a true watershed? Do you think we are going to see a different Germany in future than we know from the past? I guess uh, you know Germany better than, than I do, and, and you, you follow uh, this much closer, uh, closely. But I think what, is, uh, what, what has changed in addition to those landmark decisions? I think um, the understanding that uh, we, uh, also new members in European Union, NATO, uh, from the eastern part, we should be listened to because we know Russia. Uh, I think that this has changed. Uh, and also what has changed, um, I think it is the idea that we have to do things together. And I also mean in defense. I mean, if every country is spending 2% on, it on its defense, but everybody's just thinking of their own country, then we are actually weaker. Whereas, you know, air defense, I mean, before, um, before this war uh, or, or all these uh, tensions were building up, I wasn't really a military person, but, uh, but now I know the different air defense bubbles, you know, small bubbles, uh, medium-sized bubbles, bigger bubbles. And the point is that together we can do the expensive things that cover a much bigger area if we just don't think about our own country. And so if, for example, Germany is spending its 2%, um, then uh, I, I don't think it's wise that it spends it only uh, here because we have to do this together. And even for, you know, Baltic countries, we have decided that we will procure some uh, capabilities together because uh, this is something that we need to do together. And those capabilities for Europe have to be mobile, they have to be, uh, you know, uh, movable wherever. And it is not that we, we should get, and I think this has changed, that, uh, that we are not thinking that this is mine and uh, this is protecting my country. But if my neighbor's house is on fire, uh, you know, I also am in danger, so I should help to put down the fire in my neighbor's house and it will not catch mine. Thank you very much. One last question, if I may, and it's a very, very difficult one, but on the basis of all that you have said to us this evening, what do you think an acceptable and feasible solution to this conflict could look like? There's only one, uh, one uh, solution to the war, and this is that Ukraine wins this war. Otherwise, I, I just, um, you know, every other solution is, um, is not uh, voluntary. I just had uh, 
several meetings and, and if I hear somebody saying that, oh, if there is peace agreement, then, then we will see what, what else is there. But, uh, but uh, you know, I say that let's zoom out of the picture. It's not that they have negotiations because Ukraine invited uh, Russia to the table. What kind of territories we can give you? It's not because of that, but because, you know, they're killing the civilians in Ukraine and that's why they want to have peace. But whatever agreement they will conclude, it's not voluntary. Ukraine is not giving the territories away voluntary. And, and this is what we have to understand, uh, that uh, we shouldn't pressure Ukraine into this, but we also should understand and not recognize uh, what, is, uh, what is coming afterwards. And therefore, uh, for me, the only, you know, uh, really good solution out of this is that we give Ukraine the military aid so that they will push back uh, and the troops of Russian, uh, Russian troops will be withdrawn from Ukraine uh, in total. Thank you very, very much, Prime Minister Kallas. We are deeply grateful to you for sharing your insights with us this evening. Und auch Ihnen, meine Damen und Herren, möchte ich herzlich danken für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Wir können das Gespräch nachher fortsetzen bei einem Empfang oben für alle Anwesenden oben im Staffelgeschoss des Forums und darauf freue ich mich sehr. Aber zunächst hören wir noch ein Stück Musik von Musica Libera. Wir danken Ihnen auch sehr für Ihre Begleitung des heutigen Abends. Bitte, Sie haben die Bühne. Applaus